So if we look at this, the, the U.S. situation, so here we see um, inflation relatively low. Um, or I would argue it's relatively low. And certainly if we're talking in the context of what it was in the 80s, it's way low. Um, just, uh, and I've mentioned this uh, a couple of times um, over the, well, any conversation that I'm recently having, well, why is it so low? And I would argue, basically, since that time, since that Reagan administration, inflation has gone nothing but down. And of course, it blips up, it blips down, you know, quarter to quarter things happen. But as a trend, inflation is low or almost non-existent. Why? Why? I mean, this is, this is pretty cool. And under Ben Bernanke, we've adopted something that we, um, uh, that we, uh, I'm sorry, it's target artificial. inflation. Well, it's artificial. It's artificial. Okay, why do you say it's artificial? And, and there, there's an element to that. <laughs> you were just about to tell us. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was going to tell you one thing that Ben Bernanke did that uh, we had not done before. Is that it is different than in the UK. So if we you know, sort of looking at, okay, the UK um, here, recent inflation 2%, go back US, 1.2%. Uh, now, the difference between the US and the UK as it relates to inflation is that the British have always targeted inflation. Okay, so part of the central bank's mandate was to target and manage inflation. That was never part of the US mandate, the Federal Reserve's mandate. Under Bernanke, Bernanke sort of took that on and said, yeah, we are going to target and what we're looking for is something approximately around 2% inflation. Okay, and now, yeah, it looks like we're pretty much clearly below target in terms of inflation. And it's not that Bernanke's sitting there going, aha, I want more inflation, but what would somebody like Bernanke want and perhaps all of us want? None of us go out there and go, geez, I wish my cup of coffee cost more this morning. <laughs> Right, but now, but I'm not. I'm not talking about a cup of coffee. I'm talking about Bernanke trying to manage the overall economy. What's he trying to do? Increase spending power. Really, power of your dollar. Yeah, yeah. And, and so, how might I do that? How might I do that? So I want to. I want. I agree. I'm trying to increase spending power of the dollar of the American public in general. Lower the cost of capital. Lower the cost of capital. Cost of capital is pretty. Um, Pretty low. We don't have. We have. Well, here's our. Here's the target Fed funds target rate, short-term rates, zero to 25 basis points. Um, basically, what what's what's happening is we're trying to drive growth. We're trying to drive GDP growth, right? That's the thing we want to drive. Okay. The thing. The problem is, as this thing, and we see that this is positive, but it's not like wow, it's starting to really move up. So what's happened is we've introduced stimulus to try and stimulate the economy to try and facilitate growth. One of the side effects or hangovers of that big growth party, which we haven't actually seen, but we're trying to have the big growth party, is that you start to see inflation. But when inflation is low or, quote, below target, well, that just means it's time to keep partying, right? Keep adding the stimulus, try and keep things going because where growth is positive, and well, at least here, stable. Uh, and if we look at what's going on in the UK, it's exceeding what's going on in the UK. So okay, things might be arguably better here than they are in the UK and in and, and the rest of Europe. Uh, but we're still not sort of where we'd like to be. Um, that's sort of indicating that we might want to continue this party. But this is what we're going to sort of look at is sort of some of the implications of this. And just to, again, to set some stage, because we're going to start dissecting some of this terminology. Uh, we go back, look at the US, just again to center, our rates are low. These are short-term rates, so this is what we call Fed funds, or federal funds. Um, and this is the target rate. Okay, so that's some jargon, that's some terminology. Fed funds target rate. Um, so just so we're all on the same page, Fed funds means what? What is Fed funds? It's the rate for what? What do I use this rate for? Treasuries. Um, it's a good idea because it says federal, so you'd think <laughs> treasuries, but that would be wrong. Um, the banks borrowing from each other. Yeah, it's banks borrowing from each other, which is sort of the, the funny thing because it says federal funds, but it 
it's not a government rate, it's right. rates between banks. Yeah. So it is a bit of a misnomer and can be confusing because it doesn't, doesn't sound like what it is. Um, so it is a bank rate, so Fed funds um, is a bank rate. Fine, and then we have the target rate. Okay, and so how this works is the Fed funds is an interbank rate, so banks lending back and forth to each other. Why we call it the target rate is because the Federal Reserve, now the government, does say this is what I want the number to be. So you independent banks, go do whatever it is that you want to do, but by the way, I'm the 800 pound gorilla in the room and I'm going to make sure that this is the answer that you all arrive at. Okay, so we believe in free markets as long as you do what I tell you to do. Okay, then they're not so they're not free anymore. Then I'm going to manipulate the markets, and that's exactly what the Federal Reserve does. It intervenes in the marketplace to force the market rate to be 25 basis points or less. And it has been they've been effective at that. That's they accomplished their objectives. Um, generally, people don't get in the way of the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve sort of sets its mind to something. Uh, it can be a very expensive lesson to, to get in the way of that. Um, and it was sort of interesting is I um, was just recently down in Bogota talking to uh, central banks for uh, the uh, basically northern Latin America. So Mexico, the northern part of South America, Brazil, um, and then the Central American countries. So there's, um, I don't know, about 15 different central banks represented there. And we we're having this, this discussion. Uh, the conversation was about risk of managing foreign reserves. But where are the foreign reserves? What do you think all of Latin America has in their foreign reserves? It doesn't matter what country, if you're Brazil, you're Colombia, yes. you're Peru, US dollars, right? And if you've got US dollars, what do you put US dollars into? Into treasuries. So it was all about, you know, sort of this stuff is central to them. So you think like, oh, we're doing policy and it's all about the US stuff. It is all about the US, but the ripple effects through the world are massive. And you see everybody hanging on every last word of now Yellen. And what she's saying um, really, really matters. So this stuff really matters and translates through our global economies very, very quickly. It affects other countries' foreign reserves almost immediately. It's, um, it's pretty wild how interconnected the, uh, the globe is. Um, so a couple things, again, to set the stage here. Uh, so just looking at levels of debt about 100%, so that means our revenue, our GDP, gross domestic product, the stuff we produce, and our level of debt are about the same, okay? Now, just again, for context, prior to the crisis, so read 2007, we were about 60%. So, you know, lots of different ways to think about leverage. You say, ooh, we're borrowing a lot of money, which we are, but it's in relationship to the size of our economy. And it used to be about 60% of our economy, now it's about 100% of our economy. Okay. Uh, I'll also set the stage, give the British perspective on this. Um, again, the Brits are approaching 90%, so a little bit less than us. We're at 100%, they're approaching 90 so a, bit, a little bit better than us. Also, pre-crisis, uh, they were at 40%. So historically, they've always been less levered than the United States. Um, but nonetheless, we see in both countries a massive um, uh, expansion of, uh, of the country's um, debt. Um, uh, you, you may be getting this, but can you talk a little bit about just the British, the whole austerity plans, and like the, every time I'm in London I hear and we turn on the television, it's all about austerity plans, and that's just so cultural for them, but not for us. <laughs> okay. Um, Is well, that why, in your opinion, their numbers are more conservative? Well, I think their numbers also are more conservative. Well, I, I think I think it's not. I don't want to say austerity is ever easy, especially as the Greeks. I mean, yeah, Greeks are not having fun with austerity. Uh, but I think culturally, there is that austerity is accepted, um, and I think that's I think that's true not only in the UK, but I think that's also true in Ireland. Um, so I don't know if it's a Northern Ireland, you know, country, you know, island country type thing. But there's definitely culturally the tolerance for more austerity, um, and, and yeah, austerity. But also remember that the social services are also a lot higher there as well than they are here. Um, so you know things like healthcare and stuff, which are 
uh, are paid for there. Here we have private insurance, so it's a, it's a, a bit of a different system. Um, I think also if you look at the percentage of the GDP that is in the UK associated with government spending versus the percentage of GDP here in the United States that's associated with government spending, it's wildly different. And you know, opinions vary on this, but generally, you know, you, you have capitalism and then you have communism, you know, sort of extreme ends, and you have like sort of socialism in between. Um, where do where do we sort of draw lines here? Well, you know, opinions vary, but generally, if you get over 50% government spending, you say, well, it's kind of a socialist country, right? Because half the spending is the government taking care of its people. So. The, during the financial crisis, the British spending went over 50%. Um, and so, you know, th that, you know, was what it was. So, you know, more money being spent on social spending. Um, now, you know, austerity, I think, because the government is such a large portion of the GDP, that austerity and the gov cutting government spending can really dramatically affect things. And now, you know, if you look at sort of, you know, 50% versus ours is in the low 20s. And of the low 20s, um, about 8 or 9% of that is federal government. Okay, most of that spending is the state and local government. So, you know, who maintains your roads, your police, your fire? It's not the federal government. That's the local government. So that's where the bulk of our, quote, government spending is, is in the states and their subdivisions where then the federal government's budget is, you know, eight, nine, let's call it 9% of GDP. And that is two-thirds defense. So two-thirds of that is projecting force around the world. Um, so in terms of the scale of austerity and, you know, what government spending can get cut, the, 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 the two things outside of defense that our federal government does is they deliver the mail and then they have Medicare and Medicaid. Um, those are really, that's it. That's kind of all that, ha you know, and, and there's unemployment insurance. There's, so the, you know, and so that's why you hear everyone's targeting, you know, healthcare, healthcare, healthcare costs. Why? Because that's, other than defense, I mean, that's the big nut that our federal government spends, where uh, in other parts of the world, there's a whole larger basket of social services. Um, so I think that's why you hear about austerity. It's austerity, it's from a different perspective though. Okay. Um, okay, so um, there's a couple things that we've seen. Um, quantitative easing, uh, QE. So you'll hear this terminology, uh, quantitative easing. Uh, just so we're all on the same page, what does that mean? Okay, uh, keeping rates um, at an artificial level, um, yes, okay. But now, like, just to, just to compare and contrast, we talked about um, Fed funds, the target rate. So the federal government says, here's the rate banks, you sort it out amongst yourselves, but this is going to be the rate. How is this different? This is something different. It's related to keeping the rates artificially low, so that's the result, that's the objective. But it's mechanically, it's something different. Reducing volatility? Um, well, you can suggest to the extent that the federal government was not intervening in the marketplace, the market would be more volatile. So I think that's a fair statement. They're buying actual they're buying. They're, they're buying securities. That's they're buying a client. Um, they're, buying. They're, they're buying assets. I, I'm not sure I'd quite phrase it as client. They're being clients. But they are, they're absolutely buying assets. That's a, absolutely correct. And so you think about what's happening is they're trying to add stimulus, they're trying to add money to the market, right? Push money out to the market. So what do they do? They say, okay, we're going to make money cheap. So we drive interest rates low, but now the target rate's between zero and 25 basis points. What else can I do? I can't go, we're going to make them negative. You know, they're, they're at zero. So then you sort of say, well, the Fed is out of tools to use to try and further stimulate the economy. But then Bernanke said, no, 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 I can invent something new. So this whole concept is literally something that he made up, this quantitative easing, which is going out and, as you put it, 
buying securities in the marketplace. And what happens when I buy assets, I'm pushing cash, right? Because I buy it and I give you money. Um, it's treasuries, it's mortgage-backed securities, uh, mortgage-backed bonds, yep. So I'm buying assets, and, and, and the way to think about it from a, from a, you know, I'm managing the economy standpoint, is I'm buying assets, which means I'm giving you cash. And so I'm flooding the market with cash, and then that cash has got to end up somewhere, and hopefully the idea is into things to stimulate the economy. Okay, now the problem if I push too much cash out, or what happens if I just start giving everybody, everybody tons of money? I'm sorry? The value goes down, and that causes inflation, right? But then we're seeing there's no inflation. So what's my incentive? Keep pushing things out. If I'm not getting the growth that I want on the economy, and inflation's not an issue, just keep giving you money, keep piling in the money. Now, and, I, and I'm sort of simplifying saying there is no inflation. Um, inflation does crop up in different, uh, different markets. Um, you know, one of the things you, you, know, you indicated was saying, well, that number's not real. Okay, well, there are some elements to the calculation that aren't real, but let's talk about that. I'm gonna, um, let me skip around a little bit, just, just to talk about this inflation for a second, just to define it. I'm going to come back, but I'm just jumping ahead a few pages to talk about sort of how we define inflation, which then I think circles back to your point of it's a little bit um, misunderstood. So generally when we're talking about inflation, people are talking about this thing, uh, which is uh, CPI. A consumer price index. And by the way, throughout the slide pack, you'll see I've pulled in a bunch of Bloomberg slides, which is what your clients are going to be working with. Your internal clients are going to be using the Bloomberg terminal. And um, so we're using the Bloomberg terminal. So we're speaking in the same terms, looking at the same exact things that they're going to be looking at. Um, so what is CPI? And we said that this is the most typical or traditional measure of inflation. Goods it's goods and services, yep. So it's goods and services. So it's goods and services, and it's all the goods and services, um, well, that we buy. So here, obviously, good old American flag. So we're talking about the U.S. in this context, and it's, so it's U.S. CPI. So it's the goods and services. It's the goods and services that Americans buy. It is what we say is our basket. It's our basket of goods and services. So this is all the things we buy. This is a roll of paper towels, a gallon of gasoline, a dozen eggs, a gallon of milk, all the things that we consume. This is our basket of goods. Here it is. And some of its services as well. Um, so maybe we go to the doctor, we consume, you know, medical services. Um, this is our basket of goods and services. Fine. Um, this basket uh, is a static basket. So how we measure inflation is we say, okay, what's the basket of that stuff cost a year ago? What's the basket cost today? The difference, well, that's CPI, that's inflation. And that's what we were showing in the previous slides for both the UK and the US. Now, how this is sort of artificially low, well, there's some weird things. So now think about this. Let's say in my basket is a television, a computer, an iPhone, an iPod, whatever, some piece of technology. Well, what's been happening to any of these items? Price goes down, right? And so, you know, you look like well, a flat screen TV. When those things came out, it's almost hard to imagine. But if you remember, they were $10,000, $10,000 for a flat screen TV. Yeah. yeah, I mean, so it's not like, oh, the price stayed flat or the price came down a little bit, it's on sale, you know, at Best Buy. No, I mean, these things have collapsed, absolutely collapsed. And that's not just the TVs, that's the same thing for computers, that same thing for, you know, what happens every time there's a new iPhone or iPod, the older generation price goes down. Okay, like it's not. that is a brilliant question because this is what happens in the CPI. 
<laughs> no, it really is. It really is. Because this is, this is the weird thing. This is why I'm saying there is a bit of manipulation here, um, if you want to call it that. So what happens is they say, all right, well, how are we going to do this? Okay, so government, I'm trying to do the right thing here. I'm trying to give you good information. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the cost per, um, you know, processing power. So, so what's the processing power of this computer? And we're going to have a cost per that processing power. So if the price stays the same, but the processing power doubles because of technology advances, well, then the price just went down in half. Okay? So not only are you seeing that, like, you know, and it's sort of, I always use the laptop computer. And how much is a laptop computer? I mean, you can obviously buy one with all the bells and whistles, and you can buy a stripped out one. But by and large, a decent workable laptop, about a thousand bucks. Okay? When I was in college, they're about a thousand bucks. Okay? The price is the same. Okay? But, you know, 25 years later, the processing power of this computer. So what's that going to be translated into in terms of the CPI calculation is deflation. Price is going down. So you have that with your flat screen TV that's no longer $10,000, but you also see that for the laptop computer, which is about a thousand bucks. Okay, there's also a calculator when I was in school, a financial calculator, HP12C. That was the, the, the industry standard, HP12C. Cost a hundred bucks when I was in school. Still cost a hundred bucks. Um, now in that case, uh, that's just HP making gobs and gobs of money because they used to be made in the U.S. Now they're made in China, uh, and HP is just now raking in the cash in that the technology hasn't changed. It's the same old, same old calculator, um, and, and it's still, still a sort of industry, uh, industry staple. But nonetheless, what happens in this basket of goods is that you have everything that's technology related pushing down prices, right? So that ends up reducing things. So maybe your milk went up, maybe your, your cost of eggs went up, but that also that TV went down massively. And so that offsets it to then make the overall picture look benign. Um, just so that we're also on the same page, the, the, the swing factors on CPI, so when you see CPI jumping around, because everyone you know, sort of looks at the big headline number, but what's going to really manipulate CPI? So if eggs go up, milk goes up, it gets reflected. But that's not really going to drive this number. Okay? So you think about, of all the things you spend money on, eggs and milk, is that the most expensive thing in your budget? I wish. I wish. What's, what's the biggest nut in our budgets? Housing. 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 So that's either the cost of houses or that's rent. So that gets, that's the biggest part of um, uh, CPI uh, that is in there. So that is a big, big driver in what this ultimately looks like. But now once you've done that, so once you've sort of signed your lease or bought your house, you kind of locked in whatever those costs are. Now it's done, you got a contract or you own the house, whatever it is, the cost of the cost. So now what's going to be the biggest swing factor in your budget? So we asked what's the biggest part of your budget. Now I'm going to ask what's the biggest swing factor in your budget? What changes significantly the amount of money we might spend, whatever, on a weekly or monthly basis? Okay, that's true. So discretional spending. So decisions I make. I'm thinking here, but now what, when you say that, you're absolutely right. And we're going to address that in a sec, in, in the sort of the next sort of look at inflation. But when we go for entertainment, you've actually, you've changed your basket. Because last month you didn't do the entertainment. This month you are doing the entertainment. So that's a different basket, right? So we'll talk about how that gets addressed, but it does not get addressed in here. Because it says it's the same static stuff and the same static stuff. So I'm not talking about changing in buying patterns. Taxes? Well, they, they, they change, and so taxes have gone up. But month to month, my taxes don't change, right? It, it is what it is. Gas, energy, energy, energy. So, yeah, what does it cost me to heat my home, drive my car, those things? And I can't control that, right? I, I, I you know, it's, I try to turn down the heat. My wife turns the heat back up. You know, I just, you know, the, it's, it's, the, the good is static. I still need to drive to work. You know, the office hasn't moved. I haven't moved. The distance is about the same. So I tend to repeat that over and over again, but how much I spend on it could vary 
fairly significantly. So when we're looking at this, biggest chunk, housing, the biggest swing factor, energy. Okay, and so then this leads to something called um, um, core CPI. Okay, core CPI, this is X food and energy. Okay, why do we take out food and energy? Because food and energy are those biggest swing factors. Okay, those are the things that jump around a lot. So if I'm trying to manage an economy, I'm trying to do things, and I'm doing things that Janet Yellen's doing in terms of manipulating the economy, well, I can't have a number that's jumping all over the place. Very, very difficult to manage from that. So we strip out the volatile stuff and say, let's look at the core basket of goods and services. And to the extent there's pervasively high inflation, or uh, high food costs or high energy costs, well, that'll permeate into other things. So things like, you know, plastic, it's made out of, it's a petroleum product, right? So energy goes into making this. So if the cost of the, this pen doesn't really change, fine. Energy spikes up until that, you know, gets into the cost of the pen. We don't really look at that as inflation in terms of managing the economy. Day to day, it costs me more to fill up my car. I feel that. I know that. Um, but the way in terms of managing the overall economy, we don't really do anything about that until it trickles into other products, if that makes sense. Okay, um, so that's what core CPI is versus what they, it was referred to as the industry jargon or slang is the headline number. When they talk about the headline number, they're talking about the full basket of goods and services that we buy. That's the quote headline number, and then when they say, Oh, and the core number is, the core number is the headline number less food and energy. We strip out food and energy. Okay. Um, and so then this is looking at those current numbers. So if we look at um, CPI um, year over year, that number is right here, 1.5%. And we look at less food and energy, 1.7%, uh, so slightly higher. Okay, so that is suggesting that you know inflation is sort of starting to come come into uh, the system, um, which you know it brings us to this sort of you know this issue. So we have the central bank in there trying to stimulate the economy, trying to get GDP to grow. We said there can be uh, implications of that. One of the implications is inflation. Um, we talked a little bit about buying power. Well, one of the things that could also happen is if I flood the world with dollars, I could devalue the dollar. Okay, and now you'll never hear a politician say, oh, let's devalue the dollar, let's cause inflation. I'm for inflation, I'm for a weak dollar. No politician will say that. But their actions of what's actually happening by pushing more dollars out, well, tends to be inflationary and tends to weaken the dollar. So they would never say that, but that might be a consequence of what they're doing. And they're not stupid. They know that this is a possibility. How do we feel about that? Low inflation, weaker dollar. Doesn't sound good. But if we sort of walk through the mechanics of this, think about, okay, What's the sort of, of the financial crisis, what's the, the, the biggest problem, right? We may have lots of problems, lots of funky things, but what's the, like, the biggest problem of this financial crisis? Isn't that your other point, but is that the reason why we're doing the tapering? Is because they want to avoid inflation, but think that there's a lot of talk about tapering to avoid that scenario? Okay, yeah, so the, it's actually on my, my last slide. So we talk about tapering to avoid, and that, that's right. So this tapering, let's just, because uh, you will hear, hear about that. What does that mean, tapering? Yeah, okay, so this is reducing the amount of quantitative easing that we're doing. So here, the federal government was going out and spending $40 billion per month, per month, on mortgage-backed securities. 
So we're spending $40,000 a month on mortgage-backed securities, and now we're talking about tapering that down to $35 billion. Okay, so that's what we can be talking about by tapering. But bear in mind, this still means that we are spending $35 billion a month of stimulus. So we're not, not stimulating, right? It's not like, oh, oh, we're tightening. No, we're absolutely not tightening. We're slowing the pace of stimulus. And now, and this is what people will be talking about, is... This sort of, because this is, this is a tough thing. You think about now I'm trying to grow the economy, I'm trying to manage the, this inflation thing, and now I've begun this tapering. Now, what I do here in the rate of tapering is the controversy, is the thing. How do I do this? To basically keep growth going, but pull back so I don't crush the dollar and so I don't cause hyperinflation. And that's, that's what we're talking about. That's what's going on. That's the debate. That's what Yellen is struggling with. And I'm not saying she's struggling. She's managing this challenge of trying to keep the economy going while I'm pulling back on the throttle. Okay? The throttle is still down, though. Okay? We're still stimulating the economy. We're just doing so at a slowing rate. And it looks like the economy is improving. You know, and it, it's just sort of interesting because I think it is improving. It's a lot better than the UK. It's a lot better than Europe broadly. Um, but just uh, as I actually heard this statistic as I was coming in this morning, um, we're all in financial services. How about financial services jobs? Where are we today versus, you know, pre-crisis? Very different. Very different. Very different. 19% down. There's 19% fewer financial services jobs today than there was in, say, 2007. So, and that's, that's here locally. So that's, you know, tri-state area, whatever you want to call it, you know, the New York metro area. Down okay, so the number of people are down, the comp is down. Okay, but now here I was just a second ago kind of spinning a rosy picture of the United States, right? So, oh, and I do think there is a rosy picture in the United States. I think things are improving. I think things are getting better. Okay, now financial services space, um, you know, perhaps the heyday is the heyday and, you know, things will never come back the way they once were, you know, unclear, but um, certainly things are more scrutinized. You mentioned compensation levels, um, job functions, oversight, all this, you know, compliance, all these things are uh, coming down so that maybe life is a little bit different. But where is, where's the bull spin? I'm, t I'm telling you the market's growing. And here we're seeing this sector that we work in is down 19%. That's a big number. After, whatever, five, six years of recovery, we're still down 19%. Where's the big recovery? Well, it's on Main Street. Remember, the, you know, everyone's talking about Main Street's mad at Wall Street and stuff. Well, it's on Main Street. That's where the recovery is. It's not on Wall Street. The Wall Street's not recovering. Okay, but Main Street is recovering. Okay, and you look at um, you know it's, I've I've heard it dubbed the, the sort of the renaissance of American manufacturing. Now we'll see, but that is happening. Okay, manufacturing is coming back to the United States, and the the economy across the country is developing. Um, couple sort of in interesting factoids, and uh, I, I mentioned this on the last Knowledge Bite, and I just kind of think it's cool. Um, largest U.S. exporter of automobiles. So what company is the largest exporter of automobiles in this country? So cars made, he cars made here in the United States exported around the world. I didn't say that. I just said cars made here in the United States exported around the, around the world. Those are good guesses because they both manufacture a lot of cars here, but no. No. Oh, I, don't, I don't know what Hyundai does in terms of manufacturing. Uh, Mercedes, that's a good guess, but no. It's close. BMW. BMW is the largest exporter of vehicles here. 
Okay, those X5s and X3s, all those things, those are made here in, I think it's South Carolina, and exported around the world. Uh, so BMW is actually the largest exporter of um, cars. So if you have an X3 or an X5, you bought American. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> it's good to know. Oh, phew. <laughs> I can feel better about that. Um, okay. Um, but so that's, that, that, yeah, that's sort of interesting. That, that's a little interesting factoid. But what's really driving the economy? Where is the economy growing? It's not BMW. That's a nice little, uh, little piece of trivia. But it was housing, rebounding. housing is rebounding, but okay, housing is it's got to rebound uh, based on something. Okay, which is true that it is, um, and I think certainly Manhattan has just gone crazy. I mean, that's really rebounded, but that's Manhattan again is a weird thing because it's 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 not an American city; it's a global city, and it is influenced by global things. Well, it's always in a bubble because, you know, if you can't afford it, then somebody from Saudi Arabia can afford it or then somebody from China can afford it or somebody. There's always going to be a demand here. It's not about the local population that drives New York. Well, payrolls are growing, right? So, so payrolls are growing. So that's, but what, what is, I'm, you know, talking about this, you know, sort of renaissance of American manufacturing, American industry, things happening. That's going to drive some payrolls, some positive things. Where is it? It's not here on Wall Street. I mean, you know. Technology, okay, so technology is we've seen a lot of tech, tech IPOs uh, going on. So there's certainly the, those, um, those California uh, places, Northern California is sort of rocking and rolling. How about the middle of the country? Farming. Farming, okay, yeah, but I don't know if farming is cheap. Oil, yeah, energy, energy. All of a sudden this whole, has anyone heard, heard of it's um, um, shale? Shale, um, so there's natural gas and oil coming out of shale. And you'll hear this fracking or fracturing the rock to generate this, this stuff. We're actually producing massive, massive amounts of energy. In fact, so, so much so that we don't actually have the infrastructure in place. If you go to sort of the Dakotas in the middle of the country, we're just flaring off natural gas. We're just literally just burning it up in the air polluting, unfortunately, and also not capturing the energy, just wasting the energy. Uh, why? Because there's no place to put it. We don't have the pipelines in the storage to pipe the stuff. So the stuff is literally just coming out of the ground and we're just flaring it up so it doesn't blow up. Don't you think that's not, it's such an evolving thing though. Mm -hmm. Right, but what does that mean? Well, but you could say that about you know building a railroad. Well, it hasn't existed. It's not you know. yeah. So what I'm talking about is is that this is creating opportunity yeah. for build investment in infrastructure, building that pipeline, building the gas processing, cool. right? Uh, you know, you want to build a railroad. I'm going to put it through your backyard. Well, you're not going to like it, but it's good for everybody else. And yeah, I mean, it's, so it's it's always going to be a political thing. And you know. No, we've never seen that. And that's why everyone's, you know, sort of kind of excited that this is sort of potentially a new American renaissance in manufacturing. Also, sort of what's happening? Why did all the manufacturing leave here? So expensive. What's so expensive? Labor. 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 Right? So it's all about labor. So then it went to cheap labor markets. It went to India. It went to China, places where uh, labor costs were lower. Fine. So we lost a lot of manufacturing. Now it's coming back. Okay, and we talked about, you know, okay, maybe there's opportunities to invest in infrastructure, maybe that's a positive thing. But what does manufacturing look like today? Go to that BMW plant in South Carolina. Machines. Machines, robots, electricity, energy becomes an important input into the factory. Skilled workers, technology, who's going to fix the robot? Who's going to program the robot? Who's going to calibrate the robot? That's not about having, I need... 20,000 people, I need them cheap. No, they don't. I need expertise. I need access to energy. I need access to markets. I need, you know, transportation. Need yeah. And so now all of a sudden being able to throw 1,000 people at the problem isn't the answer. It's throwing technology. And now what's my biggest cost is energy. And all of a sudden, if this marketplace has cheap energy, 
then all of a sudden we're the low cost manufacturer. So it's interesting that this, this shift is going on. So it's, 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 frankly, it's kind of cool. But that's where you're seeing the growth. It's not here in the tri-state area in Wall Street jobs. It just isn't. Um, it's happening across the country because of, you know, we need infrastructure for energy. We don't have it. And, um, and then that's potentially driving back manufacturing. Um, and, and so you know, here's the slide I was looking for before. But, you know, so this is the question of the tapering or the unwinding. Sort of do I do it too fast, too soon? Okay, and that's, that's basically what we've been talking about. Um, is you know, now these things are starting to happen, and now we're starting to reduce the amount of, of um, uh, stimulus that we're putting into the economy, so we are starting to taper a little bit. So that's what that's talking about. A um, couple things I wanted to look at, looking at some Bloomberg slides. So this is looking at CPI around the world that we've already sort of talked about. We've sort of, I think, flogged this one pretty good, but... Um, just sort of look at it. So if we look at uh, CPI around the world, um, that's actually here in this actual column. And we see the US is low, the headline CPI, um, as compared to other places, also low, slightly higher in uh, the UK. But now um, we're looking at where we're forecast. Okay, so we're looking at inflation being forecasted up, accelerating accelerating, um, but still below the target, right? So the target is, again, 2% now. So we're still, um, even if we're forecasting acceleration inflation, it's still below target. So you're seeing now Yellen doing this game of she's slowly tapering, but, you know, no knee-jerk reactions. We're sort of managing this down. And frankly, it kind of feels like we're doing a good job. You know, it feels like we got this under control. It feels like we understand what the issues are, and we're um, we're managing them appropriately. Only time will tell, but it uh, it seems like we're doing uh, a decent job there. Okay, now this is um, a screen that I like looking at on Bloomberg, and and there's a lot of sort of jargon information that we can pull out of this one. Uh, if we ever happen to stumble across a Bloomberg and you type these letters, um, PX1, and then you uh, hit the enter key, which on Bloomberg would be go. Uh, so you type PX1, then go. This screen comes up. I like this screen just because it shows you a whole bunch of different things um, in very generic form. So this isn't really a trader screen but it does give you a lot of uh, information about a bunch of different markets. It's predominantly a treasury screen. Um, and so here we have bills, which if I say it's a treasury bill, what is, what's the jargon there? What is, how do I know it's a bill versus a, so I got bills, notes, and bonds. What's the difference or how do I know what's what? They're all treasury securities, so they're all issued by the U.S. government. How long they take to resolve? Yeah. Okay, so how long they're issued for? So if so, the, the the only difference here is about mature. Well, I don't say the only difference. We'll talk about the difference. But is okay. So ten year. All right. So ten year would be a note. So we say it's a ten year note. Okay, and we'd actually see that. If I there, there's our ten year. So our ten year note. Fine, and then I got a seven year. I got a five year, three year, two year. Okay, so those are my, my notes. Okay, and then the bond is the 30 year bond up here at the top. You have to buy a 10 year note to get a 2.5% rate of return. 2.65 <laughs> uh, two to be precise. Yes. Yes. It's a beautiful thing. <laughs> You're dating yourself too. <laughs> um, yes. Um, so these are notes. Okay. So notes. The difference between a note and a bond is just the maturity. So notes are ten years and in. Bonds are above ten years, which is the thirty-year bond. Okay. Now we also had. I also had bills. So how do I know it's a bill? Short term and 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 you're right. 
But what does short term mean in finance terms? Money markets. Okay, and what is you're right. So short term money markets, and how do I define the money markets opposed to the rest of fixed income? It is, but there's a cutting point somewhere. I got to draw a line here and say this stuff is money markets. This stuff isn't. Under a year. Yes. So my dividing line, the line I'm going to draw here, is this is one year. So these are less than, less than one year, and this stuff is uh, greater. And it's the. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, that's perfect. That's perfect. All right, because then they'll also use, oh, I'm a Govies trader. Well, okay, well, where on the, and then, then you can ask, well, where on the curve? Right. Where on the curve? Okay, where on the curve means what portion of this stuff are you trading? Because typically a Govies trader doesn't trade all of this. There's just too much information, too much to deal with. Uh, now, now I'm dating myself. No, wow. I after some of the scandals and stuff, I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I it's just come to think of it. I don't. Um, yeah, I mean, now you mentioned it. I guess most people just say treasuries, treasuries, treasuries yeah. and that, that's kind of it. Um, okay, so. We're looking at this, so the, again, this is this PX1 screen. The other thing that it shows, uh, jargon-wise, so we already got the notes, uh, notes, bills, and bonds, what those mean. Um, jargon-wise, you also notice that there's a couple things, the stuff in white here uh, that I highlighted. So there is the two-year, whoops, the two-year, the three-year, five-year, seven-year, 30 year, all these ones that are in white, okay, because notice now this is a seven year, this is a seven year, this is a five year, five year, five year, three, 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 but there's the one in white, right? In each instance, there's the one bond, here's a bunch of 30s, but here's there's the one in white. What's the one in white? In, in not that they're always in white, but that's just the way Bloomberg's done the coloring. Yes, they have been sold already. Secondary. These are our trading in the secondary market, yes. All of them are trading in the secondary market. Which, by the way, what does that mean? That's great little jargon of terminology. Sec already they're already issued, right? Primary market is the new issuance. So when they're being sold for the first time, when capital is being raised, we say primary market. And then, as you correctly point out, you said secondary market. Okay, that means this stuff is just trading in the marketplace between uh, investors, right? So just between Blue Bay and whoever else, that's just what's going on, okay? There's just people buying and selling this stuff. Um, so they're all in the secondary. But what's the significance of the white one? The highest amount? Like, are you just categorizing based on that? No, it's not about the amount. It's the, mo it's the most recently issued. Recent. It's the most recently issued one. So it was the one that's closest to being the primary market, okay. right? And now they're all trading the secondary market. Okay, the jargon of the slang that you're going to hear, and people would refer to those, they would say those are on the run. So it's not born to run. That's a Bruce Springsteen <laughs> song for those 80s folks. Um, or those non-80s folks. <laughs> Most recently issued. Most recently issued. We call those the on the runs. So you might hear somebody say, oh, what's the on the run curve? Or what's the on the run treasury? Or something like that. What they're talking about, it just in plain English means the most recently issued treasury. So for us, we just got our primary dealer status. Yeah. It's good. The Canadians are helping us out. The Royal Bank did it. You guys are doing it. It's awesome. So when Yep. We're required to buy in the volume. Is this the white? You're buying on the white stuff. You're, You're buying, buying the on the runs, yeah. okay. right? And then presumably you got client orders behind you. Okay. But yes, you are participating as a primary dealer in the government's auction of securities. So I think 
that makes us 23. I think there's 23 primary dealers. Yes. It's it is? It's okay. Small, it's, yeah. yeah. It's well, it's gone in the sort of the, the, the bottom of the market. It got down to 18. Yeah. And during the 90s, when every Japanese bank in the world was piling in, it got up to like 40. So, okay, fine. So that's what those are. Those are the on the runs. Other things I want to sort of just draw your attention to. Uh, another one, another part, a little uh, nugget of jargon here. Tips. Mm, we're just hiring a tips trader. We're just hiring a tips trader. Wow, <laughs> see, and all this stuff is real world. I swear I don't make this stuff up. <laughs> Treasury interest protected security. Inflation protected. Yes, inflation protected. So this is, this is Treasury inflation protected securities. Those are tips. Um, and that's um, Treasury, and then it's inflation protected. Okay, so, um, and just again, jargon wise, if I was in the UK and I was hiring somebody to do the same job, what would they be trading? They wouldn't be trading, we wouldn't call them tips. Gips? <laughs> That's good. <laughs> no? They, and this is, this is not just in, in the UK, but it's really pan-European. Um, but we'll blame the British, because they actually came up with this structure. Uh, it, they're called linkers. They call them linkers. So the jargon of the slang in the UK and really across Europe is linkers. So if you say, oh, it's a linker, or I'm trading a linker, it's the same thing as a tip. It's just in the UK or in France or wherever, it's the same security. In fact, our tips is, because uh, usually I'd say Wall Street innovates here, but in this case, the British actually came up with this and we copied the British. So the British linkers were out before the US tips and the US basically copied that structure and created the tips. But we call them Treasury Inflation Protected Securities. Europeans call them linkers, they're the same thing. And where, just so you know where it is, the linkers doesn't really sound cool. Tips sounds cool, trade tips, yeah. Okay, it's inflation linked. It's linked to CPI. So they just, that's where that terminology comes from because the, the bonds are linked to CPI. As ours are, we just don't say that. Um, okay, fine. Um, so that's what's going on there. Um, Another sort of uh, just other thing that you see on the screen, um, just sort of anecdotally, again, I never trade off this information, but you know, you're on vacation, you just come back, what's going on in the world? Well, we got all the, the treasury, and this would be called the treasury complex, right? So what are we looking at? What have we been discussing? We haven't been discussing one thing, we've been discussing the treasury complex, right? The stuff all about, that's what that means. Okay, now there's also things like the Dow Jones Industrial Average, so an equity index, S&P 500, equity index, oil, gold, and again, these aren't screens that we trade off of, but you just sort of go, where, what's going on in the world? Well, as Francis said, okay, well, the 10-year treasury is at 265, price of gold is 1296 an ounce, oil is 100 bucks a barrel, the S&Ps are at 18... Eight, Yes, but that's just the last tick. So here, I'll move it over. But um, again, I wouldn't use that as, oh, it's you know, going up. Yeah, I mean, but it, it, it does tell you what the late, most, most recent movement has been. Um, but so it's a nice thing. I wouldn't use the screen to trade anything, but it's just a nice lay of the land. PX1 sort of tells me what's going on in the world, uh, essentially. I like that. I like the screen. It's a nice, nice, easy screen. Okay. That we're trading on the difference between the Fed rate bond that's been issued. Okay. And issued okay. And what we're issuing. So I guess with agencies and other. Okay. Other fine. Fine. So all right. Uh, okay, and I was going to. So there's something else on the screen. We'll come come that's back okay. to that. There, no, but, no, that's great. So so spread product. Okay, all that means in, in that context is that it trades at something okay. a, above the treasury rate. So if we think about this, and we'll go back to 
Francis's 10-year Treasury at uh, 265. Okay, well, if IBM is going to issue a bond, if GE is going to issue a bond, uh, our clients, right, or Rogers Communications or you know who, uh, uh, a Canadian company, well, then it's going to be spread product because the rate isn't going to be 265. It's going to be 265 plus something, plus a spread. And basically, the idea behind the spread is the additional compensation that you get for taking the credit risk. You're talking about on the issuer side. Well, or, well it's the issuer, you're trading it. Uh, I mean, it doesn't really matter the context. It's a spread product. It's going to trade something above treasuries. So it could be a mortgage-backed security. It could be anything. It's just going to trade at a higher yield than the corresponding treasury. Hence, we call it a spread product. And so that spread is the compensation we're getting for taking additional credit risk. Just so we're all on the same page, because I, I, I sort of haven't talked about this, but um, here I'm going to suggest this entire treasury complex that we've been talking about is risk-free. You buy that? <laughs> no. No. Oh, knife through my heart. Um, why? Why? Why am I arguing that this is risk-free? The government issued, but so what? They could be Bob issued. What's the matter? Yeah. James, come on, man. What's wrong with Bob issued? You're well, laughing. If you look at the soundness of the issuer in the U.S. government, there's you know, a lot more than the Greek government. Greece or whatever. Yeah, sure, sure. Absolutely better than the Greek government. I'm with you 100%. <laughs> um, but now, but remember what I showed you about you know, the debt level was going up, right? We were at 60%. Now we're at 100%. So the debt level has definitely gone up. Debt ceiling. Debt ceiling. That, 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 that's, that's worked really well for us. Who's going to buy their goods if they call in all the debt notes? Well, there's just a, well, how, do those, how do those treasuries get paid? What, what's the currency? How do we pay them? US, US dollars. USD. US dollars. Right? And so where do we get U.S. dollars? The government. the government prints them. So the government owes money. The government prints the stuff that repays those debts. So at the end of the day, it's risk-free because if the government says they owe you $100,000, they can print the 100000 and pay you. Right? And that's it. You might not be able to buy a Starbucks with it. But nonetheless, um, that's it. So it's risk-free. There's a whole host of reasons. They also have taxing power. They can raise your taxes to balance the budget. They can do all these things. But at the end of the day, the bottom line is the government can just literally print the money and hand it to you and say, debt's paid. And it is. Um, now, obviously, that would be horrific from an inflationary standpoint and, and you know, have lots of repercussions. But nonetheless, it could happen. And so that's why we refer to it as, as the risk-free rate. Anything that's a spread product is trading at some sort of rate above that. And because there's perception of risk associated with, with whatever it is we're talking about. Okay, the other thing I was just going to show you on this slide, and I wasn't sure if this is where you were going with spread product, is there's um, this little line item, and this is you know, a little bit on the sophisticated side, but if you're building out desks, you'll hear people talking about these. These are curve trades. So curve trades is comparing different points. So now these are all treasuries, right? So these are all risk-free securities but we're comparing the different points on the curves. So the, the, the one that most people talk about a lot or is frequently watched is the twos, tens. So you hear somebody's the twos, tens spread is 226 basis points. So there's 226 basis points between the rate of the two year and the rate of the 10 year. Okay, so what is that doing? That's telling you the extra you have to pay to borrow for, um, for 10 years. Okay. Does that work? Yeah. So that, that, that's a, a, well, it's a different type of spread. Okay. Um, so one thing I wanted us to take a peek at here uh, as we're looking at this is um, let's look at those tips versus um, 
and we'll sort of um, we'll kind of start wrapping it up in the, in the next uh, next ten or so minutes. Um, but the uh, looking at the ten year, the ten year rate, as Francis pointed out for us, is two sixty five. Now, what I'm going to show us is if we're going to go look at those tips, we're going to go then look at the uh, tip. Let me just blow this up a little bit. Okay, there we go. So the tip for um, 24 right here, right here, this is the 10 year tip. So now if we look at the yield on the 10 year tip, it's 45 basis points, 0.45. So here is the U.S. government that can borrow money for 10 years. So both are for 10 years. So this one is, this matures um, 5 of 24, so May of 24, 2024. Okay, and this one is of uh, January uh, 2024. So um, essentially the same maturity. Okay, so it's a 10 year bond. But here, the traditional or straight bond is trading at 265, so the yield or the cost of borrowing for the US government, 265 basis points. Is everyone okay when I say basis points? Okay, yes. So there's 100 basis points in a percent. So it's just moving the decimal around. But most people, industry slang, would say until we talk about yields and basis points. So I'd say it's 265. And then I come over to the tip. It's 45. So less than half a percent. Same borrower, US government. Same maturity in round numbers. Wildly, wildly different interest rates. So it's not a difference in credit risk because the credits to the U.S. government is the same. So it's not even whether we disagree whether it's risk-free or it's not risk-free. It doesn't matter. It's the same issuer, same maturity. Why are the wildly different rates? How is this possible? Risk. Maybe. Maybe. The tip it's a 10 year. 10 year, but it's inflation. Okay, right. Okay, it's inflation protected, which means the, t the mechanically what it means is the tip adjusts for inflation. Yeah. So the tip's adjusted for inflation. So now this is a pretty cool thing. So now think about this. So this is just what we call a nominal bond. There's no adjustment, there's no nothing. It's just a plain old bond. Okay, its yield is 265. Okay, this is. An inflation protected security where it's at 45. So they're the same thing except for this has got inflation protection, no inflation protection. With me so far? Okay. And I would argue now that they're the same issuer, it's the same maturity, they should have the same yield. That's what I'm going to argue. Same maturity, same issuer, same yield. Has to be. Otherwise, how could this be fair? The only way this is fair is if inflation is what? Two hundred and twenty basis points. What do you think? The only way this can be, the only way that and that can exist in the marketplace is if inflation, because the only difference between them is inflation, so inflation, as the market is predicting, must be 2.2% or 220 basis points. Well, then the market's wrong. Okay, so what is saying is, do I know what inflation is going to be over the next 10 years? I don't. But I can look in the marketplace, and the market is saying, the market is predicting inflation over the next 10 years. So I'm not talking about the next quarter or whatever, but over the next 10 years is going to be 220 basis points. Now, is that right? 
I don't know. But what I do know is that very sophisticated people are betting billions and billions of dollars that that is correct. Doesn't mean they're all right, but that's our best guess. That's kind of a cool thing that we can extract out of this. So nowhere on the screen does it say inflation is this. It's not a government number. It's not adjusted by the price of your flat screen TV or whatever. It's what the best guess that the market has. And that's kind of a cool thing. Okay, this concept that I've just shown you, I've just introduced to you, is what we call break-even inflation. So that is what inflation must be to break even on those two bonds, right? Because they should be fair. It's the same issuer, it's the same risk, it's the same maturity. The rates should be the same. Well, in order for that to be the case, this is what the implication is for inflation. And the slang of the jargon that we use is we call that break-even inflation. And now what this screen does I just showed you uh, here on, on this page is it shows you around the world the rates, of the places where break-even inflation, so again, not statistics, not government's opinion, but market forces are telling us that the highest rates of inflation around the world are expected to be in South Africa and Brazil. Now that's not my opinion, that's just the fact of what the marketplace is telling us as we read the tea leaves, as I've just shown you how to read the tea leaves. Okay, the places around the world where inflation is the lowest, again, not my opinion, not the economist's opinion, but what the market is telling us by reading the tea leaves is that it's France, Sweden, Italy, Germany, Italy. So basically Europe, inflation is the lowest. Inflation highest. Again, not my opinion, but market forces. So I think it's a kind of a cool thing because you know I ask an economist, well, what do you think? You know, I'm gonna get 50 different answers. And that's all well and good. It's like, you know, what are the two jobs you can be wrong all the time and still keep your job? It's being a weatherman and being an economist. And yeah, you know, it just is what it is. There's not, not perfection. And I'm not suggesting that this is perfection but it's at least people betting a ton of money on this. So there's economic factors behind this that has resulted in this. And I think that's kind of a powerful thing, and it's a nice tool to have, a nice thing to look at. And so that's what break-even inflation is. So we can get inflation from government statistics, or we can get inflation as predicted by the marketplace. The other thing that's cool about this is I just focused us on the 10-year, you could pick whatever you want. There's a five year, there's a 10 year, there's a 30 year. And so there's market predicted inflation over different time frames. Which again is, I think, kind of neat. Okay. All right. Let's see, anything else we want to talk about? Um, okay, this one, uh, another version of inflation. I know we've beaten inflation to death here, um, but everyone's going to know what it is, that's for sure. Um, Okay, this was the thing where you were talking about entertainment. So I entertained this uh, this month, I didn't entertain last month, and so my expenditures are changing. Well, this is what we call um, PCE, personal consumption expenditure. And this one is a dynamic basket. It is a changing basket. So this is about how much money you're spending with a basket that flexes. So where this really comes into play, it's not really sort of an entertainment thing, but it's where, let's say, um, I have steak once a, a week in my diet, and all of a sudden the price of steak skyrockets. Well, I might still want a protein, but steak's kind of expensive, so then I switch to chicken. I have chicken once a week. So fine, what I've done is my basket has shifted, so my actual spending or my budget hasn't inflated because it's the basket shifted. So PCE takes into account this shifting of the what's in your basket or uh, uh, a more dynamic measure of inflation. Okay, needless to say, the expectation, if you're comparing period to period, is generally the PCE is less than the CPI. Does that make sense? Okay. All right, um, and this supposedly is the one that Janet Yellen is actually looking at. 
this is the one that the government actually is supposed to be working off of. Uh, this, this slide, our 14th slide, uh, Treasury launches new instrument. Um, this is also worth noting, especially if you're going to be a primary dealer. In January, the government started issuing a new security, which is the first time they've issued a new security in 15 years. So they haven't done this in 15 years, and they launched a floating rate note. So now treasuries are, there's a floating treasury. So it's a floating rate note, and this is our new financial instrument that's brand new as of January this year. First time ever that the US government has issued a what we call floater. Okay, so that's not a Caddyshack floater, but it's a uh, floating rate piece of debt. Um, and that's, uh, again, a new security that, that we've issued. So that's, that's noteworthy um, that, that we started to issue floating rate debt. Also, there's probably going to be demand for these instruments uh, if you believe interest rates are going to rise, well, then that would tend to drive you as an investor to be interested in this, this type of thing. And so the U.S. government's kind enough to accommodate you by creating them. Um, any questions, concerns? Question? Yes, please. Um, so with the ongoing and most recent unrest in Ukraine and sanctions against Russia, how do you think that's going to affect our economy? Um, How is that going to affect our economy? OK, um, well, uh, people not going to Lucas Oil to buy their, uh, fill up their cars with gasoline. Um, I, I think the, um, the reality is um, you, know, you have to drink Polish vodka instead of Russian vodka. Um, I, you know, our dependence on Russian imports is, is pretty limited. Um, I think where the, the sort of the real issue, the big issue, is on energy. Russia is the world's largest exporter of energy. So everyone thinks, oh, it's the Saudis or somebody in the Middle East. It's actually Russia is the largest exporter. So from a global standpoint, the impact on energy prices globally could be a factor, and that would certainly impact us. So I don't think it's directly Russian imports, although we do import some oil, but I, you know, we get them from other places. But it's really what that does from a global perspective. That really, really crystallizes itself for the Europeans um, as they get the bulk of their natural gas from Russia to basically heat Europe. Uh, and then obviously that, well not obviously, but I think 40% of that gas flows through the Ukraine. So there's, um, you know, some issues there. Um, I'm sorry? For the global economy. For the global economy. And so where, what does it really mean to us, global economy and the U.S.? I think it's really energy prices. Um, you know, obviously if there becomes a, a military conflict, you know, that could be a whole host of stuff. I don't think anybody really wants to go there. I don't think, I, hopefully that's not a realistic possibility. But um, I think sanctions and just disruption is price and energy. And we've actually seen energy prices tick up as things, the, the rhetoric starts getting tougher, then you start to see energy prices move up. And that would be that WTI, the West Texas Intermediate that I showed you. Uh, and that has moved up in the last week. Other questions? Okay. All right, guys. Well, I'm going to um, let you go.